third hand and go to John 17. I know you don't have three hands, but you know what I mean. Stand with me if you would. John chapter 3, John 13, and John 17. Read a, a few verses here. John chapter 3, it's a verse you ought to be real familiar with. Some of you, I, I think many of you might even be able to quote it by memory. So, since you know it so well, why don't we do this? Why don't we all say it together? John 3, verse 16. It says here in the Bible, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Turn over to John 13. John 13. John chapter 13. John chapter 13, in verse number 21, and I'll read a few verses here. It says, When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit, and testified, and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Go to John chapter 17, John 17. A few chapters to the right. John chapter 17, verse 23. The Bible says here in John 17 and verse 23, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and the, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Let's go, Lord, in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for... The opportunity to, to come. We thank you, Lord, for um, truth. Lord, uh, there's a lot of things that pose themselves at truth as truth. Lord, there's a lot of things out there that are uh, an imitation of truth. Lord, I'm glad that we can have your word that is true. Lord, that we can have a God that is 100% true. Lord, the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, I, I pray you teach us something this morning. Lord, about the relationship, Lord, a very special relationship you had with one of your disciples. Lord, let us long as your people, as individual disciples, Lord, to, to have that kind of relationship with you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Be seated if you would. You know what you learn in John chapter 3, the Bible says God loved the world. Amen. Uh, you learn in John chapter 17 that the Lord God loved the disciples, all the disciples. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, it says that uh, husbands, love your wives as Christ, what? Loved the church and gave himself for it. So you see that, that, that it goes from loving the world, here's this big group, and then you see that, that he loved the disciples, there's a smaller group, and then you see that, that uh, he loved the church as a whole, and then you go down to an individual in John chapter 13, an individual that's mentioned as being one that Jesus loves specifically. And, and, and we're going to talk about who that is. The Bible explains to us, we'll learn who that person is. Uh, look, if you would, at John chapter number 20. John chapter 20. Since you're already in John. John chapter 20. John chapter 20 and verse number 2. This is, after the, this is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and the other disciple. Look at this. Whom Jesus... Loved, and saith to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Go over one chapter. Go to John chapter 21. John tw uh, 21. You're going to see this phrase used over and over in the Gospel of John. The disciple whom Jesus loved. Now look, uh, we're clear in the fact that he loved all of them. Uh, according to, to the, what you see there in John 17, he loved all the disciples. And yet there's a, a special relationship with one of them. So much so that he identifies himself as a disciple whom Jesus loved. Look, there's a lot of titles that you could be given as a Christian. I can't think of a better one than being a disciple whom Jesus loves. Chapter 21, look at verse number 7. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Notice it's a disciple whom Jesus loves that knows before anybody else that it's the Lord. Same chapter, look at verse number 20. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, 
Which is he that betrayeth thee? All through the Gospel of John, this person is mentioned as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Look at John chapter 19. John 19, look if you would at verse number 26. I say this a lot, I'll say it again this morning, we're going to look at a lot of scripture today. Uh, John 19, verse 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by, whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. Who is that disciple? He's the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now you know what's interesting about that? What's interesting about that is that there's, I mean, think about this, guys. Uh, think about the titles that people have in the Bible. Abraham's called a friend of God. That's a good one. That's a good one. But think about the things that are revealed specifically to John that nobody else ever learns about unless you hear about it from John. Why is that? There's a relationship there. And look, I'm not talking about being saved. This morning, if, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior... Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going I'm to address that. I'm going I'm to explain what the gospel is. But if I believe most of the people here are probably saved, you know what you need to understand? You are not just called to be saved. <laughs> you are, yes, thank God your sins have been forgiven. Heaven is your home. Jesus Christ is your friend. You've been called to be something more than that, though. You've been called to be a disciple. Look, a disciple doesn't mean that you're just saved. A disciple is someone who's disciplined. A disciple is someone that, that follows in, in, in the teachings of Jesus Christ and follows in his footsteps. I mean, a, a disciple is someone that, that follows a, a specific discipline of something or somebody else. In this case, Jesus Christ. Understand, when the Christians in, in Acts chapter 13 or Acts 11 were first called Christians there in Antioch, that was not a small thing. That was a huge thing. It was used as a term, not of endearment, but rather as a, as a slander, as, a, as something like, oh, those, those, those stupid Christians, those, those ignorant Christians. It's a name today that we think is very important, is it not? Why? Because it means you're following somebody. You're following Jesus Christ, or you ought to be, this morning. A disciple is someone who learns or who receives or professes to receive instruction from another as the disciples of Jesus Christ did. Understand, a disciple is not someone that provides lip service, but someone who's actually following Jesus Christ. And I'll say this, I believe most Christians, most Christians, not all, I would say most Christians today have a very shallow relationship with God. God is a good luck charm. God is the, the rabbit's foot when they're in trouble. God is... You know, hey, God, I've got this mess in my life, so I need you to help me. Uh, God, I don't know how I'm going to pay this bill. Does God care about the, those things? Yes. But for most Christians, you know what the relationship with God is? It's just that. When I need him, I pull him out. What's your relationship with like, like with Jesus Christ this morning? Could, if he looked down and said, you know what, boy, I love New Heights Baptist Church. Yep. But, man, there's something about that one right there. I've got a special relationship with that one. Can you say that about you? I would like to think he said that about me. I don't know that he could. I don't know that he could. But I want you to understand that John is that disciple whom Jesus loved. And I want to I wanna maybe help you out. If you want to have that kind of relationship, you want to have a relationship where God, think about this, folks, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God inspires John to write the Gospel of John and never refer to John. Isn't that something? In the gospel, what I mean by that, in the gospel of Matthew, it mentions Matthew. In the gospel of Luke, it says Luke's name. You don't read about John being called John in the gospel of John. He's always called the disciple whom Jesus loved. Why is that? He was humble in how he presented himself. You want to be close to God? You know what you need? You need some humility. Look at Micah chapter number 6. Micah chapter 6. If you're saved this morning and you'd like to... Take your relationship with the Lord to another level. You'd like to have an intimate relationship, a real relationship with Him. Paul says it like this, that I may know Him <laughs> and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. You know what he says? No. Look, that is not, you're talking about somebody there. When Paul says that, who was on several missionary trips, he writes half the New Testament. He writes half the New Testament. He's been on several missionary trips. He heals the sick. 
He raises the dead. And after all that, he says, that I may, what? Know him. He wasn't talking about being saved. He was already saved. He's talking about knowing the Lord in an intimate way. And you know what most of us are, are, are happy with? We're happy. We're content with saying, well, I went to church. I read my Bible this week. I prayed. I did my thing. I'm good. <laughs> Don't you want to be closer to him? Don't you want to know what it's like to know that, man, the, the fullness of the presence of God is with you? I understand that, that I, I really do. I get the fact that once you're saved, the Holy Spirit of God indwells you. He seals you. And, 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 and look, you're not going to lose that. Thank God for that. But man, don't you want the fullness of his presence? Don't you want to know that whatever it is you're doing, man, he's in it? He's at the center of it? Don't you want to have an intimate relationship with him that, man, when you're in the car by yourself, your mind's not drifting off in a million places, you're thinking about him. And he's talking to you and you're talking to him. You say, what's needed? Humility. Look at Micah chapter number 6. John was humble in presenting himself. Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6, and look if you would at verse number 8. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee. If I, were to, if I were to say, okay, to have a close relationship with God, what are the things that God requires? You know what a lot of us would do? We, oh, I've got to be a soul winner. I've got to read my Bible. And these are all things that are true. But, you know, if you boil all those things down, you know what you find a lot of what those things go back to? Look at Micah 6 and verse 8. He says, look, this is what God requires of you. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. You say, what was needed? What did John have to have that relationship with the Lord? Humility. Humility. Humility does not mean thinking less of yourself than of other people. Nor does it mean having a low opinion of your own gifts. It means freedom from thinking about yourself one way or the other at all. How much of your mind is on you? At a reception honoring a musician named Sir Robert Mayer on his 100th birthday, an elderly British socialite, Lady Diana Cooper, fell into conversation with a friendly woman who seemed to know her well. Lady Diana's failing eyesight prevented her from recognizing her fellow guest until she peered more closely at the magnificent, at magnificent, magnificent diamond excuse me, and realized she was talking to Queen Elizabeth. Overcome with embarrassment, Lady Diana curtsied and stammered, Ma'am, oh ma'am, I'm sorry ma'am. I didn't recognize you without your crown. The queen replied, It was so much Sir Robert's evening, I decided to leave it behind. You say, what is that? It's not about me tonight, That's what she meant. It's about somebody else. You know what we need a little more of? Some humility. Lord, it's not about me. It's not about my ministry. It's not about or what I can do or what I've accomplished. You know, when you find yourself getting down as a Christian, especially if you're trying to do something for the Lord, there are times where you find yourself getting down, and the reason that you're down is because you're thinking about your accomplishments. What have I done? And look what I've done and what I haven't done. And, oh, man, I wish I could. You know, and there's nothing wrong with taking assessment, doing inventory, and saying, Lord, I'd like to do more for you, but not so much concentrating on what I have done, but rather, Lord, what you're missing. Does, does that make sense? Instead of thinking about me, thinking about him. It's humility. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. You know what the opposite of humility is? The opposite of humility is walking into a room, that room being somewhere in your house, that room being this church building, being anywhere. And when you walk in thinking, what do they think of me? What do they think of how I'm dressed? What do they think of what I say? What do they think of how I look? Uh, are they going to shake my hand? Are they going to serve me? You understand, when you walk in a room as a, as a Bible-believing Christian, the thoughts of the mind should not be captivated on self. What does that take? Humility. 1 Peter chapter 5, look at verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Let me say this right now. A lot of churches... I don't want ours to be one of them. There's a lot of churches where every third sermon from the pastor is about how people are dressed. God cares more about you being clothed with humility than he does about some external standards. Now, does he care about those things? Yes. Does he care about modesty? Yes. 
But I can tell you right now, you could be modestly dressed as a lady, and guys, you can come with your suit and tie and your hair comb and everything else and be full of pride. And it'd be useless. It's a charade. It's, it's a charade. It's a facade. It's, it's, it's nothing. It's just surface. You understand that John's name is obscured in the Gospel of John. Matthew mentions twice his own name. Paul mentions his own name in all of his books. Moses mentions his name in his books. John doesn't name himself. You may read about John the Baptist, but not John the disciple. He's the disciple whom Jesus loved. You say, why is that? Because his name wasn't important. You know what was important to him? He had a relationship with the Lord. You know what we've done with Christianity? We've done it with music. We've done it with preaching. We've done it with everything. With music, it's getting your name on a label. You know, the whole Christian contemporary movement is about entertainment. With, with preaching, we've done it even in, within our own independent Baptist churches. You get some big name person, and oh man, this is who, oh, this is important. We've got to listen to this person. It's, it's about show and pizzazz and, and lights and camera and action and, oh, look at me and self. John didn't even name himself. Do you ever think about the people that aren't named in Scripture and what God did with them? How about a little boy whose lunch was used to feed 5,000 people? How about a, a woman, a widow woman, who took care of the prophet of God, a great woman of Shunem, the Bible says. Countless stories of people in the Bible who you will probably never know their name until we get to glory. I, you know, I wonder how it's going to be. I, I think about that sometimes. You get to glory and, and you have the mind of Christ and so you see somebody and you know that, uh, you know that they're a certain person, even if we're all like in the image of Jesus Christ, you know who that person is. And you go, oh, you're the boy that brought the lunch. Ah, you're that great woman. She wasn't named. Look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. You know why marriages fall apart? You know why churches split? You know why Christians can't get along? Pride. Pride is the opposite of humility. You know what we need more of? Humility. Humility is the kind of thing that you never stop asking for, and if you actually understand what it is, you never thank God for having it, because once you thank God for having it, you probably lost it. Amen? Humility is that thing that's almost not attainable because of this flesh. You just ask God for it, and ask God for it, and ask God for it, and just understand you don't walk away from a conversation saying, how humble was my attitude there? You don't walk away from a situation and say, man, I was the servant and he was the chief one in that one. Because once you've done that, man, humility just flew out the window. Isn't that just sort of, isn't that how we are though? I mean, you get in a situation where you go, man, that guy was really proud. I'm glad I was a mature Christian and I showed humility, right? Isn't that how we are? That is. And the problem is once that comes in and you start allowing that thought to come in, pride is taking hold. John chapter 1, you say, how important was John's life to the gospel of John? Does John go into John's history? Nope. Look at John 1, look at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended not. You know what you get from that? You get that it is not about John. It's about Jesus Christ. Ever read the beginning of Luke? Now look, God, God used Luke like he used Matthew, like he used John. He used all of them. But you ever read the beginning of Luke? Let me read it to you. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order and most excellent Theophilus. Now does God use that? Sure he does. But you know what he says? He says, I've got to give you this letter and put it in order and I'm going to send it to you. John doesn't even bother with that. You know what John does? He just says, in the beginning, it's about him. Your life is a letter, Christian. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 this morning. You 
You want to be a disciple whom Jesus loves? Lay your pride at the feet of Jesus Christ. Guys, we live in a generation, it's, it's, so, it's so much more evident, it's right in your face. I mean, think about this. Self-E, right? I mean, can you get any more self-consumed? And can I just say this, ladies, can I help you out a little bit? The 50 variations of, it's old, okay? I'm just trying to help you out. All right, take a picture of your kids, but the 50 shades of, all right, it's just weird. Someone say amen there, please. Amen. All right. Probably offended somebody there. I'm trying to help you. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse number 1. Do we, be, do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we as some others epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? You have to understand what Paul is going through with the Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, he spends a lot of his time trying to validate his ministry to them. He's got a carnal church. They don't want to listen to his instruction. And so what Paul is trying to do is say, look, do I really need to send letters to you or have letters from you recommending me? And he goes on to say this in verse 2. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. You say, what is that? An epistle is a letter that was sent from one person to another person or from one person to a church. The epistles of Paul we read in the New Testament. And he says, look, you... <laughs> You Christians, you're a letter. And you're known and read of all men. You're an epistle. You are something that's written. Your life is a testimony. Your life is put down where everybody can read about it. How does your letter read? If, if God were to say, okay, we're going to add the Gospel of Adrian, would it start off with, man, I was born in 1981. I grew up in this home. I did this. I did this. I did this. I, me, I, me. Or would it just say, in the beginning, God did something great. And eventually, somewhere along the way, he allowed me to be a part of it. <laughs> How does your life story read? You know why John wrote the Gospel of John? It wasn't to validate himself. Look at John chapter number 20. John chapter number 20. Everything about what John did pointed to another person. Pointed to Jesus Christ. John 20, verse 30. John 20, verse 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. He says, man, here's why it was written. It was written to point people to him because it's all about him. And when I point you to him, that you might find life through his name. I'm just an inconsequential person involved here. I'm just a vessel that God used. Look at 1 John chapter 5. You're going to see it again. 1 John chapter 5. Take the average Christian today and you ask them what their plans are, what their life is about. You ask a young person, well, I'm going to go to college and I'll, I'll go and start my career and eventually I might get married, I might have kids, I might do this, I might do that. And somewhere in there, they may or may not mention God. God is sort of a, a person in the background. You see, we've got this thing reversed. It, it's sort of like those, you ever look at those pictures where at the Museum of Science, they have these pictures where you're supposed to look up there. And I know if you've ever been to the one in Denver, they used to have this thing where it's a picture and it's got all these shapes and colors in it and you're supposed to find an actual picture in all of that. You ever been to those things? You had to stare at it long enough and people, I have never ever gotten those things, ever. You know, people come alongside, oh yeah, Adrian, it's right there. And I'm looking, I'm going, I don't see it. Oh no, you just got to look at the color red long enough. I'm looking, I'm looking. I don't see, I just, this thing's getting me mad or anything else. I don't, I don't get it. But you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to look at that long enough and see what's really there. And what you find out is what's on the surface is really sort of what's in the background. And as a Christian, you know what? People should see you, but as they look longer and harder, they should see that you're just the background to him. 1 John chapter 5. Look at verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Who's writing? John. That ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name 
of the Son of God. What's the point? It wasn't about him. It was about somebody else. It was about the Lord and about those who needed him. Christian, let me ask you, do you want to be that close to Jesus Christ? You say, why was John so close to the Lord? Why was he that close? Why is he the one that leans on his, on his breast at the Last Supper? Why is he the one that God reveals things to that he doesn't reveal to the other disciples? I think maybe some of it has to do with the fact that John understood it wasn't about him. It was about the Lord. There's some humility there. But John wasn't perfect. I want to show you something. Look at Luke chapter number 9. Luke chapter 9. Isn't it funny when you get kids playing in a room, how someone does something and, you know, all of, you know, there, there's usually one or a few of them that will come and title on that one that did something wrong. You ever notice that? And so you got 12 disciples, and sometimes the Lord talks to them like a bunch of kids. He does. And uh, it's interesting that you don't read <laughs> about this certain situation in John. You read about it in Luke, and Luke mentions John by name. <laughs> all right, Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, look at, if you would, at verse number 51. Luke chapter 9 and verse 51. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And I'm, what I'm about to read to you is something that is, is sort of a two-edged sword. Something that I think is a good thing, but just taken and used wrongly. First off, to be a disciple whom Jesus loves, there has to be humility. Can I say this? There ought to be some zeal for him. In Luke chapter 9, verse 54, Luke goes on to spill the beans and tells you what James and John happen to do. Look at verse 54. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit you're of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. And you might read that and go, Ah, the Lord rebuked them. They were wrong. Now listen, what the, the, the conclusion that they came to, yeah, they were wrong. But can I say this? They had some zeal for the Lord. And I would take that over a bunch of apathetic, lethargic Christians that will hear people take God's name in vain that will watch it in their homes and not think anything about it, that will listen to people ridicule Jesus Christ, surround themselves with friends that will do that, and not bat an eye. I'll take guys that say, hey, fire from heaven, and God says, no, 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 you guys got it wrong. I appreciate the zeal, but you got it wrong. I'll take that over lethargy and apathy. When's the last time you got riled up about something for the Lord? I know I've, I've said this recently before, and I'll probably say it a million more times. When someone tells me I'm just not the excitable type, that's not true. Understand, you've got something you get excited about. Be it a football game, be it your, your spouse, you know, uh, uh, messed up your car, you know, or hey guys, did your wife ever take your car and it always comes back empty? Has that ever happened to you? You guys left me hanging on that one. I appreciate that. I'm going to pay for that later. And no guy said amen. Can I get one? Okay, all right. Thank God I'm not alone. I'll take it. You, you know what? That guy's got some zeal. The rest of you guys are a bunch of apathetic, lethargic. No, I'm just kidding. Let me ask you, though. When you hear somebody say that the historical account of Noel is not true, or you hear somebody say, well, the word used there is charity, but it should say love, or you hear somebody say, well, that was misinterpreted in the Bible, does it, does it ruffle you at all? If somebody talks about your wife or your kids or your job or your career or your education, who do they think they are? Do they not know who I am? Someone talks about God? Well, I'll just pray for them. Does anything get you excited for the Lord? Is there any zeal there? Look, John's conclusion and what he came to, I, the Lord addressed it, but I had to tell you, I believe the Lord appreciated the zeal. You say, how do you know? There's another story about a blind man that the Lord heals. And he tells that man, hey, don't tell anybody anything. You know what that man does? He goes and tells everybody. You know what God never does? He never rebukes him for it. Now, was the, right, the man supposed to disobey God? No. But you know what the Lord looked at? He saw a man that was zealous for him. And he appreciated that. You want to be close to the Lord? Can I say it like this? 
Be excited about what excites him. Be flippant about the things that God doesn't care about. You don't understand, there are some things God doesn't care about. I mean, really, guys. God doesn't care about the score in, in you know, Wisconsin. He really doesn't. You go, oh, well, those guys are playing. Well, maybe for the sake of the guys that are playing. And, and here's another weird thing. Oh, man, I'm going to get off on a tangent here. I don't mean to. But, you know, everyone wants to. So every time there's a Christian that goes and does a touchdown and prays, like, oh, look at that guy. He's really following the Lord. What's he doing on Sunday? What's he doing on Now, look, you might think, oh, who do you think you are to judge somebody? You don't have to work on Sunday. Hey, guys, guess what? That's a choice. Well, you couldn't make millions of dollars. No, I, I couldn't do that. I'm not the athletic. That's true. Well, you haven't been tested. No, I haven't been tested with that. But I can tell you this. I was tested with do we pay the mortgage this month or do we do tithe? I know how I can make up for it. I can deliver pizzas on Sunday because they asked me to, and I didn't do it. And you say that's all about No, it's not about me. What I'm getting at is this, guys. I think God cares more about people that are gathered in a small little church in Aurora than he does the football score that millions of people are watching right now. That's my point. What excites you? Think about it. What gets you going? What gets you really just charged up? Is it things that matter for eternity? He was zealous. He desired to be around the action. Look at John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Let me say this, when you start living the, the real Christian life, it will be many things, but never boring. I never, when someone asks me how I'm doing, I have, in many years, have I been able to say, I'm just really bored. <laughs> it's not boring living the Christian life. And when you attempt, when you attempt to live for Jesus Christ, have you ever read the book of Acts? Man, these guys saw some great things, and God did some mighty things, and they were a part of it. They were not bored. If you're bored as a Christian, that's because you've secluded yourself and you said, I'm done living for God, and you figured out that what you did in the past is enough for God for eternity. You're looking at things the wrong way. And you figured, well, I used to do this. I can't tell you how many Christians I talked to. I used to go to church. I used to win souls. I used to do this. I used to do this. Well, that's great. I used to pay my bills until they came and took my house and my car. If, you know, if you lived the way you do for material things, for God, boy, we'd get some things accomplished, wouldn't we? He desired to be around the action. Look at John chapter 20 and look at verse number 1. There's murmuring. There's, there's some uh, talk about, I think I saw a stone rolled away from that tomb. And it says here in verse 1, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early while it was yet dark, and in the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter, and understand, there's no way to hit a few buttons and post a status update, you know, on Facebook. The Lord is risen. Post, you know. Selfie of myself in the background. Here's the tomb. If, that, if it was modern day Christians, it'd be some guy sitting there, you know, the, tomb, the, roll stone, the stone is rolled away and he's got a picture of himself. This Mary Magdalene goes and she sees this, and, you know, she, she runs. She's excited. And she comes to tell Simon Peter and to the, look at this. She runneth and cometh to Simon Peter, and look at who else? And to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, why do you suppose, think about this, James and John are brothers. You understand that? Peter and Andrew are brothers. So you would think, if you're going to go talk to Peter, you go, let's find Andrew, right? It's not what she does. She goes to Peter and John. And I have this feeling that if you ever got around Peter and John, you go, how do these guys even get along? This guy's like lightning, and he's thunder, and he's loud, and he's, he's always in everybody's face, and he's boisterous. And here's John, just sort of in the background. They say opposites attract, don't they? Even in ministry, sometimes that's the case. And there you have Peter and John. You know why I think she found them? She knew as different as those two guys were, she knew they were jealous, and they wanted to be around the action. So she gets them. And it says here in verse 3, Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. 
So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. Let me ask you a question. When you know the Lord is in something, how quickly do you run to it? When you know that, man, this is where the action's at, this is where God's working, this is where God's doing something, I have got to be there. <laughs> or do you see I'll get there eventually? I mean, these guys, listen to this. They could have walked. I mean, Mary's out of breath. She shows up and tells them, the stones rolled away. And they didn't look at each other and go, well, you know, uh, I've got to pick up my suit from the launders. I, I've got to do this. Uh, yeah, Mary, hey, we'll check it out. Um, but we're sort of busy right now. She came with that news and they said, man, if the Lord is in this, we want to be a part of it. How desirous of you, how desirous are you to be around the action? How desirous are you to be around where God is working? How zealous are you? In Revelation chapter 3, John happens to write Revelation, by the way. And he reveals a lot of things to the Holy Spirit to us that we wouldn't have without John. And I'm thankful for John and the way he delivers the message. And in Revelation chapter 3, when the Lord gets to the church of Laodicea, he says, look, you've got riches, you've got goods, you've got all these things, but you're lukewarm. You're not hot. You're not cold. You, you know, I can't say that you're out there, you're not out on Saturday night clubbing and doing drugs, and you're not cold. But you know what you're also not doing? You're not being a voice for Jesus Christ in the world. You're not witnessing where you go. You're not excited about me. Our relationship is stale. You haven't prayed to me like, like you used to. You haven't talked with me like you used to. I mean, guys, let's just say that this is a, a marriage relationship. And if when you come home, you say, honey, how are you? Good to see you. How are the kids? Good. And go to your room every single day. Eventually, your wife's going to say, I don't think this man loves me. We live in the same place. But he does not care about having a real relationship with me. Ladies, can I get an amen there? Amen. Right? Okay. You know what you do with God? Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this food. Thank you for my family. Bless my home. Keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen. How do you, what do you, look, God is a God of emotion. He's joyful. He's angry at times over sin. He's merciful. He laughs. The Bible says that he laughs. God laughs. That's a God of emotion. You don't think the people that he has redeemed, that he's shed his blood for, that he loved enough, and he brought them out of the world, and he sees that he gave them everything on a daily basis. It's, thank you for my home. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. Lord, help me with my job. I really need a raise. In Jesus' name, amen. You don't think that bothers him? How's your relationship with him? Let me say this lastly. John was humble, he was zealous, and he was close in fellowship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to take a trip through the Bible, so I need you to flip fast with me, okay? All right? Matthew chapter number 17. Matthew 17. Matthew 17, verse 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. You see, what does that mean? He wants some special time with them alone. He takes them away from the crowd. Not only do they have the disciples, the masses that are trying to follow Jesus Christ, but then you have the twelve. And what the Lord does from there is he pulls them aside even further. You know what that's like? That's like, man, the Lord saved you, if you're saved this morning, out of the world. And he has that relationship with you. You're one of his disciples. But then there's that 12. He goes, okay, if you want to really get in and you really want to uh, follow me and you really want to know me, we'll have this, this intimate circle here. And then he goes, hey, if you really want to know me, let me take you up into a high mountain apart from everybody else. And he shows them something that nobody else sees a transfigured, a glorified Jesus Christ, what Jesus Christ will look like in eternity. No one else saw that. How about the Garden of Gethsemane? Go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Matthew 
Matthew 26 and verse 36, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. You know what he does? He takes them apart from the other disciples and he goes where they are literally, as the Bible says, a stone's throw away from the Lord when he's having that intimate time of prayer with God the Father. And yes, James, John, and Peter do fall asleep. That's true. But they're there. The other disciples weren't. How about the Last Supper? Go to John chapter 13. John 13. What am I getting at? Wherever Jesus Christ is in some of his most intimate moments with even God the Father, oftentimes you see John not far behind. John chapter 13. John 13, we read some of this earlier. John 13, and what happens here is Jesus Christ, in verse number 18, gives them prophecy and the fulfillment of that prophecy. He says, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. And he goes on to talk about how he's going to be betrayed. Verse 21 says, When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. For, for John to, to be able to have captured, he was troubled in spirit. Yes, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit of God to write that. But for him to have seen that must have been something visibly different on the Lord Jesus Christ's face. And he sees that something is wrong and, and his, his countenance has changed. He is troubled in a way he has never seen him troubled before. And in verse number 22, the disciples look one another doubting of whom he spake. You know what the other gospels say? The other gospels say that they all begin to question among themselves, Lord, is it I? All the disciples start looking around saying, Lord, is, am I going to betray you? But I want you to look at what happens here in verse number 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. There's John. You see, where's John at that moment? Listening to the heart of God. He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord... He doesn't say, is it I? He says, who is it? He says, Lord, I know everybody else is asking if it's them, but Lord, I... It can't be me, Lord. I love you. I don't, I could, I don't want to do that. I don't want to let that happen. God, who is it? You know what happens at the cross in John chapter 19? You we read about it earlier. You don't have to go there. But in John 19, Jesus Christ talks to John and he says, Woman, behold thy son... He says to the disciple whom Jesus loves, Behold thy mother. At the trial of Jesus Christ, look at John chapter 18, go there. Jesus Christ has everybody forsake and flee him. And we always remember, we always remember that Peter goes to that outer place there in the, in the, uh, the hall, if you will, the hall of judgment as Jesus Christ is being interrogated by the, the high priest and the religious leadership. We all remember that Peter is the one that denies the Lord three times, right? Do you understand how Peter even got that close to the Lord at that moment? Look at John 18, verse number 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. That disciple was known as the high priest. Who do you think that disciple was? And spake unto her that kept the door and brought in Peter. The, the only reason Peter even gets close enough to see the Lord and looks into his eyes and weeps bitterly because he denies him is because of John being there the whole time. Man, John is there at the Last Supper on his breast. John is there at the, at the trial of Jesus Christ. John is there at the crucifixion. You guys understand, no other disciple is mentioned being there at the cross. You understand that? John was there. John chapter 20, we read about the resurrected Savior. Go back there. I do want to show you something. I know we've looked at that passage already, but I want to point something out to you. John 20 and verse 4, they ran both together, and the other disciple, that's John, did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying. Look what it says, though. Yet went he 
not in. Then come with Simon Peter following him and went in the sepulchre and seeth the linen clothes lie. You may think that's a coincidence. I think that shows again and points to his humility. He gets there and he goes, Peter, I know I outran you first. I got here first, but you go ahead. I also think this. I also believe John looked in there and as exciting as it must have been to just see the linen clothes lie there, he goes, he's not here. I'm not wasting my time going in. Everybody else may want to take pictures. Everybody else may want to put this online. Boy, I was the first one inside. There. I don't care. He's not there. I don't want to be there. You know what John was consumed with? Wherever the Lord is, that's where I want to be. He's close in fellowship with Jesus Christ. John 21. One last place. John 21. John 21. Verse 3. Then Simon Peter saith to them, I go a fishing. They say to him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Now, after they go through this thing and they catch some fish, verse 7 says, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, uh, Peter, <laughs> it's the Lord. Who's the first one to get a hold of that? John. He said, I know that voice. I know that spirit. I've walked real closely with him. I wouldn't forget that voice. Everybody else was consumed with catching fish. And John, he just wants to find the Lord. He's close in fellowship with him. Let me ask you this morning. How close in fellowship are you with Jesus Christ? I didn't ask you if you're treating your family right. I didn't ask you if you came to church this morning. I'm glad you're here. I really am. I didn't ask you even if you've read your Bible today. I'm asking you, how intimate is your fellowship with Jesus Christ today? There was humility. There was zeal. And there was fellowship. Lord, I'd like to be a disciple that you love. I don't know about you. I want that. It might take some more humility. It might take a little bit more expression of zeal. You're zealous for what you love. And before fellowshipping with anything or anybody else, you need to make sure your fellowship with Jesus Christ is where it ought to be. Let's all stand.